Any pain or annoyance does me good because it distracts me, snatches me from the great void. Hey everybody, today I'm going to be talking about Silvina Ocampo. This is again a continuation of this great Renaissance or perhaps uh, neo-Renaissance or belated uh, English Renaissance of Argentine literature. Uh, previously, I did a video on Osvaldo Lamborghini and his first ever uh, introduction to the English speaking or English reading world. Uh, and we also have stuff uh, continuing to come out from, from different people, and now including Silvina Ocampo. I first heard about Silvina Ocampo in the uh, April issue that is now sort of uh, historic because it uh, has the notes from a pandemic from New York Review of Books. Uh, this is from the April 23rd issue of last year, that being 2020, uh, or this review by Laura Colby on the uh, two works that City Lights has put out, uh, Forgotten Journey and The Promise, Forgotten Journey being um, Ocampo's very first uh, work that was published in 1937. It's a collection of short stories. I'll talk about that one in a moment. Uh, and then her posthumously published only novel, The Promise. And the title of this review was Mysterious and infinitely solitary, which is a great way to describe Ocampo. Uh, in fact, reading Ocampo for the first time and also reading about her life, this she was born in a time when Argentina was a very wealthy country and she was born into a very well-to-do family. Uh, she was one of, I think, six sisters. Victoria Ocampo uh, was well <laughs> more well-known uh, than Silvina. Victoria, she rubbed shoulders with uh, the elite of society just about worldwide during the day. And she also started uh, the prestigious literary journal Sur and, uh, and was editor. You know, reading about uh, Silvina and about her home life and, and her work, uh, I, I kept having Emily Dickinson in mind. And uh, sure enough, I finally came across someone. Uh, in fact, it was Laura Colby. Uh, talked about how Ocampo uh, revered Dickinson, and there are definitely affinities here. Colby makes note that uh, her own books have been late, sorry, uh, Ocampo's own books have been late to appear in English translation, if at all. And despite now having Forgotten Journey and The Promise from City Lights, we also have uh, Thus Were Their Faces by NYRB. I have not read that one yet. If you want to check out a stunning review uh, and get way more on Ocampo uh, than I can even give you, uh, please check out Better Than Food, his, uh, his review on Thus Were Their Faces. I'm actually glad I haven't read that yet. Um, it sounds like they saved a lot of her uh, most um, biting stories for that collection. And in fact, um, her she was sort of panned by the literary establishment of her day in, in Argentina uh, because of how dark her stories uh, can be. Um, not in, it's not horror, you know, in, in 1937 and so on, dark uh, wasn't pushed to the limits that it is now in 2020. Colby points out that still missing are at least five other short story collections and nine books of poetry. Um, although some of them have been culled into selected work. I think I read she has written something over 200 uh, short stories, so she was very prolific, but very much uh, doing her own thing. And she, in fact, in contrast to her sister Victoria, uh, Silvina very much wanted to stay out of the limelight. She wanted to stay in the shadows. She was doing her own thing. As is probably well known for those who know uh, Silvino Campo by now, she was married to Adolfo Bioy Casares. Uh, these two books I've reviewed on this channel, Asleep in the Sun and The Invention of Morel. Uh, wonderful writer. Um, but again, you know, don't let uh, his reputation inform you of uh, Ocampo because again, she's doing something very different. She also collaborated with Jorge Borges and Bioy Casares on this uh, compendium, The Book of Fantasy. Uh, and of course, uh, this edition finally gave her 
Um, down here, of course, Borges' name is going to be, you know, a scrolling marquee. Um, and then you got Casares and Ocampo down here. And then on the spine, it's funny, it only says Borges. Uh, but nonetheless, she did uh, several uh, collaborations with, uh, with that sort of circle of literary, of literati in Argentina. But let's not get focused on other names. Let's not get focused on who her husband was um, in the same way that uh, when I reviewed Linda Bostrom Knoskort's uh, The Helios Disaster in, uh, in Rain Taxi last year, I was very deliberate in not mentioning her ex-husband, Carl Alva, because again, she can very well stand on her own. This is a, a, actually an excellent little book. Please check it out. Again, in the NYRB review from Laura Colby, she says, and she says this very well, she's talking about the very first story in the Forgotten Journey collection, um, and she gives an excerpt from it, and then she put, what was that? And you will find yourself thinking that over and over and over again as you read these stories. Um, something will happen, and yeah, you, you'll think, did, did I really just read that right? Uh, Colby says, we have been thrust into a position of impersonal omniscience with an awful suggestion of time that waits outside the story's boundaries. And Ocampo's most admirable and maddening quality is her refusal to explicate. And she says she is a remarkably visual writer. And in fact, she studied uh, painting for a long time, went to France, uh, studied under some, some uh, masters there, and uh, but then felt that she wasn't good enough. And in fact, this this lack of confidence and this this lack of self worth self worth um, would would travel with her um, throughout her stories as well. And especially most markedly in her novel, The Promise, um, she uh, Selena felt that she was very ugly um, and that you know her painting was no good. Um, she sort of retreated into uh, her writing very much again. Um, like Emily Dickinson's retreat, her, retra her retraction from uh, the physical world into a more metaphysical realm through her writing. And in fact, um, it is also well known amongst, uh, <laughs> amongst those who knew Ocampo, those family members and friends, uh, that she truly did believe herself to be clairvoyant. To give a feel uh, for what it's like to read her in a poetic form, I haven't read any of Ocampo's poetry, um, but I'm reading through the poetry of Louise Gluck. Um, she, of course, just recently won the Nobel Prize, um, and I felt, you know, it hit my duty to check her out, and I'm, uh, I'm just reading from the beginning of these collections uh, all the way through. Uh, this is 1962 to 2012. And really, they, they, these are beautiful, beautiful poems. I don't like a lot of uh, contemporary poetry, as I talked about in my uh, poetry bookshelf tour, but this is remarkable. But I read this uh, yesterday. Um, and of course, thinking about Silvino Ocampo, uh, this really resonated as, as something that gives a sense of Ocampo's work. I see the water as extension of my mind, the troubled part, and waves the waves of my mind, when in Nantucket they collapsed in epilepsy on the bare shore. I see a shawled figure when I am asleep who says, our lives are strands between the miracles of birth and death. I am Saint Elizabeth, in my basket are knives. Both of these books are available from City Lights. Her very first published work, 1937, is Forgotten Journey. This is 28 short stories, and they're very short. They are uh, almost uh, micro or flash fiction. This is a very small, it's smaller than a standard trade paperback. Uh, and even so, the longest stories are about four pages, with the average being two pages. The work is very subtle and very delicate. The complexities are not on the page. Uh, and a lot of what you will read will seem so mundane. Um, and most of the stories, they'll start with just some kind of visual, artistically visual description of something like an elevator. But then as you read, so it, it starts out by setting, grounding your expectations uh, in almost extreme or hyper realism. Uh, but then that will be upset by the end of the story. And then as it closes, it will leave you feeling without closure. And in fact, uh, even though Ocampo didn't give a lot of uh, input about her artistic process in her lifetime, 
she has talked about how she doesn't really care for endings because you don't really get endings in real life. Things aren't tidily uh, hemmed up at the end. She has great first sentences, however, um, throughout the story collection uh, that really uh, grab your attention. Here are some examples. One, two, three, four, five. It was already very late. The display windows stepped forward to greet her. They believed their hearts were embroidered with the same veins as the leaves in the pages of their natural science textbook. Each leaf identical and yet unique. Witch Hazel, 86% distilled water and a woman running with two branches in hand, a shapely woman against a stormy yellow background. Men are often uh, portentous characters in here that sort of loom up and bespeak um, violence and horror. Waves carried on the wind shook the trees of Sarandi Street. The man leaned out of his front door, hiding an invisible knife in his twisted face. She talks a lot about the sadness of growing older. They were becoming aware of growing up, which made one of them sad and pleased the other two. We can guess at who the one who was sad about this probably came from Ocampo. She talks a lot about just growing distant in various types of relationships as time goes on, um, lack of true intimacy in relationships, the, the ills of love. As love grew in them, so did doubt and the tedious thoughtlessness that always accompanies love. Like the indelible creases of a poorly ironed suit, the creases of ill-humored shouts and silence merged. Everything became an insult. She'll often hit you with uh, a little aphorism that'll sting, and we'll get more into those here in a second in The Promise. But here's one from a short story. It was so easy to have faith in what didn't matter that much. But she's not completely without humor. In fact, there, there is a lot of humor in there. For example, in one story, there are two friends who are insulting each other, and then we get a parenthetical aside that says, at times there weren't enough names of animals with which to insult one another, and they had to resort to the dictionary. An exemplary story in here uh, for me is the statue salesman. Uh, we start off again with this, uh, just this description of the inside of a house, very mundane, very quotidian. Uh, it says, to get to the dining room, you had to cross rows of doors facing a narrow and chilly hallway, its walls decorated with green plants framing the bathroom door. Okay, well and good. Then uh, people are having dinner and there's an introduction of some tension. A seven-year-old boy ran from table to table until he stopped at the statue salesman's table. He wasn't a bad boy, but there was a secret hostility between them. So we've got this seven-year-old kid and this statue salesman. Uh, and what's this secret hostility? Then it goes on for a bit. Um, and the, we see that the man feels very trapped um, by this boy. This boy seems to be sort of secretly leering at him and provoking him. And nobody's noticing it. Um, and it's really, really getting to the statue salesman. So then we get this, this divergence in perspectives. We swing from the statue salesman to the young boy whose name is Terso. It says, Terso, thinking that the frozen statue salesman hadn't seen him, the frozen statue salesman, because he's looking at the statue salesman uh, sitting in a house through a window. Uh, and and it's, he believes that the statue so miss, doesn't see what he's doing. Uh, the boy assumed that he had the prodigious power of invisibility and tiptoed back to bed again, feeling like he'd witnessed a miracle. So now he's got even more ammunition uh, to mess with this statue salesman. So where is all this going? Finally, we get this stare down between the two of them. It says the first few times the statue salesman tried to gather all his strength in his eyes to stare him, the boy, down. But Terso's eyes were as hard as metal doors. He had eyes that must have never cried, and only by killing him could one hurt him just a little. So now this is turning, you know, violent. And uh, as we introduced uh, the psychological feeling of the salesman feeling trapped by the young boy, uh, eventually he becomes literally trapped, um, and the statue salesman... Uh, goes, we get, go into a surreal description, uh, and then it closes. And I won't read that, uh, but suffice it to say that it's, it's just a stunning formula that Ocampo has that, um, you can easily miss it 
um, and you often have to reread passages uh, just to make sure you read them correctly and even reread whole stories. Again, there's so much satisfaction in this. Her novel that she famously worked on for something like 30 years, um, don't think in terms of the way that William Gass worked on the tunnel um, for three decades. You know, it, it seems more that she, it, it was intermittent. She didn't labor over this work uh, for 30 years straight, but she kept coming back to it, coming back to it and perfecting things. It's called The Promise. Um, and it essentially what is happening here uh, is a woman has fallen overboard from a ship on her way uh, across the Atlantic to visit family. Um, and in order to keep her mind uh, occupied and not freak out uh, while waiting for help to come, maybe for someone to notice and the ship to return or whatever, she uh, decides she has devised this trick. And she actually invites us to use it when we're in the waiting rooms at doctor's offices and, and otherwise in, during times that we need to occupy our minds. But she tries to remember um, everybody from her life that she can and give them brief little biographical sketches. So what this is, is it's a frame tale. Um, and the frame tale is, of course, uh, the, the person, the, the narrator who has fallen off a ship and is trying to stay afloat and keep her mind occupied. Um, but then that frame tale contains uh, vignettes and aphorisms. So it's sort of like uh, Scheherazade in the Arabian Nights. And in fact, that's invoked uh, explicitly in the text uh, where she's you know, trying to, to keep uh, to keep herself, to keep, uh, use stories to, to keep herself alive. One way to think about this is that uh, it, it's got that almost like a, an Iowa white writer's workshop realism to it, but then uh, it's brushed with magical realism uh, and Ocampo's brand uh, of, the, of the surreal. There are many times when I thought of Carson McCullers while I was reading this, especially uh, her, short, her short novel, uh, The Member of the Wedding. There was so much atmosphere in there and the way that she could describe uh, how the young girl felt in certain situations and in certain places. Um, it, it really reminds me uh, of, of what you get here in Ocampo. Going back to what I read to open this video, any pain or annoyance does me good because it distracts me, snatches me from the great void. This really takes on multiple levels of meaning because the whole time we're reading this, the narrator is um, literally suspended above a void. She is at the surface of the ocean and it's unfathomably deep, of course. The abyss or the great void uh, is, is threatening to engulf her the entire time. Um, and keeping this in mind as we go along, um, she subsections each of these vignettes with the name of the main character. Um, and then, but that frame tale keeps inserting itself. Like at the end of each section, most times, uh, we'll get a little narrative description that keeps that frame of her, uh, of the narrator uh, on the surface of the water alive. As Ernesto Montequin says in his uh, introduction, it takes its form as a dictionary of memories. And in fact, she does. She becomes a sort of repository of other lives. She says, I don't have a life of my own. I have only feelings. My experiences were never important, not during the course of my life, nor even on the threshold of death. Instead, the lives of others have become mine. And she says, I have only feelings. And then 50 some pages later, um, she also, there's this back and forth um, and two characters are saying, but what's the plot about? Tell me, I'm dying of curiosity. It has no plot, answered Veronica. Can one write a novel without a plot? Naturally, one could write forever about their feelings. So this is what's more important uh, than plot, feelings. There's an irony in here. She says the way that she fell into the ocean was that she slipped on the deck where they store the lifeboats. And then again with the aphorisms, everything we want too much turns out badly or never happens at all. The humiliation of jealousy is not being able to choose the object that arouses it. Sometimes too much love makes it difficult to remember. And love and jealousy are a big part of this. Um, in some ways, this could be considered as Proust light. I know jealousy so well, I replied. Who doesn't? There's plenty of jealousy to go around for everyone. 
Here's a fun fact. Uh, there is a timid maid named Seferina. It says, Seferina, a timid maid, served the table under the watchful eye of the lady of the house. And a little fun fact that I noted is that Seferina also appears as a maid, though not timid, in uh, Asleep in the Sun by Ocampo's husband, uh, Bioy Casares. Here's another one of these great terse little observations. Women love with their eyes closed, men with their eyes open. And here's a beautiful, beautiful passage here towards the end of this novel. In the seawater, I have drunk the beauty of the universe. All the animals gathered around me. They did not abandon me except to join the plants in a perfect union, wearing love's last exhalations into unfathomable concerts. Again, the books are Forgotten Journey, her 1937 debut short story collection, and then the posthumously published The Promise, both by uh, brought out by City Lights. And while I do admire her more in her short stories than in the novel, both are very delicate and brushing at the sublime and getting at something deeper than what we normally see uh, in, in books. And it's also just a great introduction uh, to the life and work of Silvino Campo. I look forward to reading NYRB's Thus Were Their Faces, and I look forward to more of her work becoming available in English. I hope you'll check her out and let me know what you think.